the Dionysian mysteries went beyond the Eleusinian in seeking actual possession by and union with Dionysus. This was to be attained through rites of an orgiastic character and an outgoing of consciousness or ecstasy. Both cults were associated with the triumph over death and rebirth into immortality. The myth of the death and rebirth of Dionysus became a prominent feature of the Orphic movement, active from the 6th century BCE. The Orphics sought deliverance from the cycle of transmigration and reincarnation through union with the divine, understood not merely as a transient ecstatic experience, but as a permanent state of blessedness. Plato's philosophy has a profound mystical element. His philosophy was preeminently a way, a means whereby a man might require true participatory knowledge of the real, the eternal. The way's end is variously described. It is being in the Phaedo, the good in the Republic, beauty in the Symposium and the Phaedrus, and the one in the Philebus, unawakened to the real, eternal world. Man perceives only the phenomenal world, the world of sense perception. In his famous cave, simile, Plato compares the situation of the unawakened to men shackled in a cave, able to see only the shadows of those who pass by behind them. Reawakened to the real world, the nominal world of ideal forms is a painful but necessary experience. From that awakening, one must strive for the apprehension of the transcendent reality that is the source of all that is. This way of contemplation and the intuitive participatory knowledge is a guiding principle in Plato's work. It is, for example, the way that the rulers of the city state must follow. It was to be an important influence in shaping the Christian mystical tradition. The mystical way enunciated so clearly by Plato suffuses much of the Hellenistic philosophical tradition. Aristotle, notwithstanding the many differences he had with his master, speaks of the contemplative life as a participation in the divine life in which subject-object distinction between man and the divine disappears. Successors of Plato elaborated the mystical element in his work. The Stoicized form of Platonism known as Middle Platonism, which held sway roughly from the first century BCE to the third century of the Common Era, developed a much clearer idea of the transcendence of God, as opposed to the divine that founded Plato himself. It was against this intellectual background that many of the most outstanding examples of Hellenic mysticism emerge. The work of Philo of Alexandria from the first century represents a form of Judaism profoundly shaped by Middle Platonism of his day. Philo presents God as erratically unknowable in himself, but made known in his powers or operations. This distinction, not original to Philo, was to have a long and eventful history. For Philo, God reveals himself according to man's capacity to apprehend him. To describe this process of revelation, Philo does use the language of the mystery religions although he was not directly influenced by them. He describes the soul's journey to God as beginning with conversion and the recognition of the createdness of the universe. Through moral purity, the soul comes to know itself and to recognize its utter dependence upon God. Knowledge of God is a divine grace, not a natural capacity. It entails a going out of oneself, a form of ecstasy, 
seen most clearly in the Hebrew prophets. The shining of the light of God within entails suspension of the faculties, entails ecstasy and divine possession and madness. In such a state, the soul is superior to man, but less than God. The hermetic movement that developed in Egypt in the first three centuries of the Christian era made some of the Egyptian religion and certainly drew upon Judaism, but was profoundly Hellenic in inspiration. The hermetic texts present a guide to mystical experience viewed from a variety of standpoints. They speak of God as ineffable, but unknowable by man by virtue of man's divine nature. The great evil is ignorance. The mystical way consists, therefore, the reacquisition of self-knowledge, which is knowledge of the divine, and the ascent to ecstatic vision of God in which man is deified, or rather realizes his own divinity. The extraordinarily complex and seductive set of traditions known as Gnosticism posed a grave threat to Christianity in the first three centuries of the Christian era. While teachings and practices vary greatly, Gnosticism was essentially an attempt to present Christianity as a mystery religion analogous to the mysteries of Mithras, Kybele, and Isis that were flourishing at that time. Teaching a radical form of dualism between God and the world, the Gnostics offered an initiatory form of knowledge, Gnosis, whereby those who had a divine spark within them might escape from the material world and find salvation. Gnostic dualism found a new expression in the third century with the rise of the Manichaean religion. The finest example of Hellenic mysticism is to be found in the teachings of Plotinus from the 3rd century, founder of a tradition known as Neoplatonism, the student of Ammonius of Alexandria. Plotinus took up the perception of the transcendence of God found in Middle Platonism and developed it out into a thoroughgoing statement of divine incomprehensibility. Plotinus's teaching is centered around the soul's ascent to reunion with the One. We know from his biographer, Porphyry, that Plotinus himself experienced mystical union with the One on several occasions. Plotinus teaches a way whereby the obscurities of the material life might be removed and the return to God accomplished. Plotinus had far more positive attitude to the material world than the Gnostics did, but is at the same time unequivocal in his understanding that the material is to be left behind on the soul's journey back to God. The return to the contemplation of God in Plotinus is also the return to oneself. It is a return to the vision of light in which the subject-object distinction between man and God disappears, in which the soul becomes that light, being raised to Godhood, or better, knowing its Godhood. Center coincides with center. This is the life of the gods and of the godlike, and the blessed among them. Liberation from the alien matter that besets us here, a life taking no pleasure of the things of the earth, the passing of the alone to the alone. The Christian mystical tradition took up and reshaped many features of the mysticism of Hellenistic period, being principally indebted to Philo and Plotinus. Indeed, while Philo's influence on the Jewish tradition was initially minimal, and many of Plotinus' successors lapsed into theurgy, or magic, it was the Christians who preserved many of the insights of these two great teachers within the context of a living tradition. Clement of Alexandria, 
integrated much of Philo's mystical teaching within the Christian tradition, most notably the motif of the divine darkness on Mount Sinai used to express God's incomprehensibility. Clement went beyond Philo in speaking quite unambiguously of man's deification. Like Philo, Clement used the language of the pagan mysteries to describe the mysteries of his own faith. Here is what Clement has to say. O truly holy mysteries, O light undefiled, I am led by the torchbearer to be initiated into heaven and God. Though initiation I become holy, the Lord is my hierophant, and as one who leads by light, Photogogus, seals the votary for himself. We should not forget how attractive this sort of language would have been to a second century Alexandrian ear. Origen's work was deeply mystical character, something that those familiar only with his On the First Principle and Contra Calcum would know. For Origen, the mystical life is a realization of the union with Christ affected at baptism. His commentary in homilies on the Song of Songs developed this theme. Origen takes Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs to refer to three stages of the ascent to God, that is, the acquisition of the virtues to the proper understanding of the natural world, and finally, contemplation of God. In this understanding, the goal of the mystical life is union with the spiritual intellect, or nous, to God through contemplation. It does not entail ecstasy. The Alexandrian mystical tradition formed a crucial component of the teaching of the Cappadocian Fathers. This is evident in St. Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses. It is also apparent in the works of Evagoras of Pontus and Pseudo Macarius. Evagrius made Origen's threefold distinction of the spiritual life classic. He also refrains from speaking about ecstasy. Macarius is less reserved and speaks of the intellect as utterly dispended and ravished, carried away by prayer and become one with it. He also follows Clement and Philo in using the phrase sober drunkenness, a motif avoided by both Origen and Evagrius. There was a danger in the Christian usage of the Hellenic mystical tradition that the mystical life would be seen as circular, as an escape from matter and a return to the pre-cosmic unity. This element of circulatory is palpable in the teachings of Origen and Evagrius. It is avoided by the Cappadocians and by Macarius in the emphasis on personhood and the integrity of the body. Union with God in these writers has no connotations into the divine. The teachings of the Pseudo-Dionysus, deeply influenced by the Neoplatonism of Plotinus and Proclus, do not adequately avoid the dangers of circularity. While their wonderful evocations of the super-rational and the ecstatic apprehension of God in the state of perfect unknowing were to be enormously influential, they lacked the personalistic element so vital to true Christian mysticism. Let me know what you guys think about magic, divination, and mysticism. Write in the comments if you know anything else about this, or if you have any experience with this. Really want to know what you guys think. You have ascertained 
True Gnosis.